Thank you for listening to Mormon Sex Info. This episode is an archived episode and is only now becoming publicly available. Mormon Sex Info relies on contributions. To contribute, please visit mormonsex.info. And now, please enjoy this episode. Welcome to Mormon Sex Info. This is Natasha Helfer Parker, and today I'm so glad to have a repeat guest. Dr. Joe Court is here with me today, and I'm going to have him introduce himself a little bit more in a minute. But what we're going to be chatting about is this credentialing question that usually comes up, I think, for a lot of people when they see all these, you know, letters behind names of professionals. Sometimes they can be confusing. As part of an ongoing debate that we've been having, uh, especially in this show, but in obviously in the population at large and also amongst professional organizations is these ideas of who are people who are certified to work around sexuality. And one of the things that we as sexual therapists are aware of is the lack of sexuality training that most professionals have, including ourselves, as we went through programs of social work or marriage and family therapy or psychology of some sort or another, and that most of us really only had about one course in graduate studies on sexuality, unless you're becoming an expert in that area and specializing in that area. But even then, it's hard to find programs that will do that. So two credentials that I want people to be aware of is uh, CST which means Certified Sex Therapist, although in a very small percentage of professionals that can also mean Christian Sex Therapist, which is a certification process I'm not really familiar with at all. But the Certified Sex Therapist credential comes with quite a bit of training, takes about two to three years of postgraduate work to complete, and we can maybe get into that a little bit. And the other one that's fairly popular is CSAT, so C-S-A-T, and that stands for Certified Sex Addiction Therapist. And why I have Dr. Court with me today is because he actually started as a CSAT and is now a CST. And so has gone through both of those processes. And I just thought it would be really interesting and valuable for people to hear from a professional who's been through both quote unquote programs to uh, explain to us some of the differences and some of the both benefits and cons of of both credentials. So welcome to the program. Yeah, thank you for having me. And I did not know, I just learned from you, that CST can mean Christian sex therapist. So I did not know that. Yeah, so that I find that highly problematic because it's the same credential <laughs> as the CST, which is Certified Sex Therapist. So anyway, yeah, and I don't know much about it, but I'm I'm planning to look into it and see a little bit more about what, what that entails. But yeah. I'm pretty sure that it does. it's nowhere near as rigorous as the you know, certified sex therapy certification. And, and I believe a reason why that program was started, my understanding is that professionals who are uncomfortable with certain aspects of the sexuality training that we receive as CSTs chose this Christian route so that they could avoid some of the ways that we are encouraged and actually required to immerse ourselves in different types of sexuality so that we're prepared to meet with clients of all different types and sorts and with all different erotic tastes, et cetera. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's a problem in of itself. But yeah, that's for another time <laughs> to talk about that. Uh, so yeah, so why don't we start off by just allowing you to introduce yourself a little bit further, tell us a little bit about yourself uh, professionally, and then we can get started with the topic at hand. Sure. So I, so my name is Dr. Joe Court, and I've been a therapist for 32 years. And I have mostly, in the beginning of my work, treated sexual abuse. I was a sexual addiction therapist, as you said, and I dealt with a lot of sexual shame and trauma, and I enjoyed it, and it was good work, hard work, but good work. I found over the years, also I did LGBT work, so I was a gay affirmative therapist, it became over the years, but I found that while I was working and helping people with trauma, sexual trauma, physical trauma, that once we would heal that, I didn't have any adequate training in how to help somebody to begin a healthy sexuality integration into their lives. And so I was either left with maybe one class I took, one weekend class I took, maybe a book I read, but mostly what I had believed within me. And that would be the direction I was taking my clients and then decided to get 
educated and trained in sex therapy. So there was a period of time where I was both a certified sex addiction therapist and a certified sex therapist. But over time, it became a competitive thing because the more I learned about sex, the more I learned how much being a sex addiction therapist did not know about sex. And so it started to eclipse the work I was doing. And then that sort of moved me, in addition to some other things, away from sex addiction and more into sex therapy, where it was more positive and more educated and more nuanced and a, a deeper understanding of what's going on with people. In my writings, I've you know written four books. And in my early years, I wrote a lot about sex addiction. I've recently revised three of my books and completely removed the sex addiction material because today I find it to be quite harmful and not helpful, particularly to men, especially to gay and bisexual men. I'll talk about that. I now talk instead about more out of control sexual behaviors and positive strength based models. Okay, so let's just start with that. Let's start with your beginnings in working with trauma and how did you go about even finding the CSAP program? What drew you to that program and and maybe help us understand a little bit about what that program entailed in getting you that those certification. So for forever, I was just a sex addiction therapist. Anyone could be one. I was a member, it was at the time called the National Council on Sexual Addiction. It changed. I was on the board at the time. We changed it to what it's now called Society for the Advancement of Sexual Health, which in some ways is a joke because that's nothing what the, that the organization did or does. Maybe they're going to change as we're doing this podcast, but in general, it was really just about sex negativity, sexual addiction and So I was immersed in that for many reasons. One is I'm 54 years old. So when I came out as a sexual person and as a gay man, HIV was in my face along with Reaganomics and conservatism and misunderstandings about sexual behaviors that weren't heteronormative or heterocentric. So I'm talking like kink fantasies and interests and fetishes. These were all deeply pathologized even back in the 80s. So for me, I had my own erotic challenges that I was trying to suppress. So even though I was coming out gay, I would say I came out sexually in terms of my sexual orientation, but my erotic orientation suffered. Those are two different things. Your sexual orientation is to whom you're attracted to. Your erotic orientation are the things you get off on and get into. And those were troubling. Mine were troubling for me. And so I decided to use the lens of sex addiction to pathologize what I did, thought I didn't want to do and shouldn't be doing, especially because I didn't want to be at risk of getting AIDS. Because back in the 80s, there was no medication. The only out from AIDS was to die. There was nothing. And I was scared. And it worked for me to identify as a sex addiction therapist. I had had my own sexual trauma in my childhood, so I was working through all that. It just it fit for me. And I actually started thinking about the fact that I fired two therapists who were sex positive and were trying to help me embrace who I was erotically and sexually. And I wasn't interested. The more they were positive, the more I pushed them away and said, I, I need I need somebody to pathologize me. <laughs> and I found them. And the whole community was there. There's like 500 things I want to ask you just from those three, <laughs> <laughs> those three minutes. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you, for me, I'm, pers- I'm purposely telling you about this personally because If you were to sit down with most sex addiction therapists, they too have a personal story on what they're sitting on. This is not just a professional commitment. It's a personal commitment. So when you, when, and what I started noticing, what made me decide to leave the field is the more I would have these discussions that would go against what we'd all learned, I wasn't just challenging people's professional selves. What I realized is they felt personally challenged, which was not my intent. My intent was to say, hey, I don't believe this anymore. I've learned this. This feels different to me. This feels more growth enhancing. And that was not how it was received at all. So just for the public's sake, let's break down some of these words that you're using. So can we talk a little bit about how you would define heteronormative, as well as even the basic ideas of sex positivity versus sex negativity? Because I'm guessing most CSATs, if you call them up on the phone and you say, hey, are you sex positive or sex negative? They're not going to say, oh, we're sex negative. So well, how, do well. we, how do we start defining those terms? 
And, you know, first I want to make sure it's clear. I'm not talking about all CSATs because there's so many CSATs that um, have gotten some sex education and have gone through and become CSTs, certified sex therapists. So uh, I can't speak for them all. I can only speak for the ones that I had experience with. Um, but heteronormative, heterocentric means that we are having missionary intercourse, so PIV, penis and vagina, that we are eye-gazing, we are intimate, we are relational, and we're having the predictable ways of being sexual that you might see in most movies. And that most and people deem, quote-unquote, healthy. I mean, that's healthy, kind of the reality, yep. right? Yep, and normal. And now what I say to people when I do my trainings is most straight people don't want to be having heteronormative, heterocentric sex. They don't know it, though. That They might enjoy that, but they enjoy a lot more than that. So anything that would be of kink, of fetish, of fantasy, that would be alternative, that might involve humiliation and banking and PIA, penis and anus, you know, those kinds of sexual things would be considered not normative and troubling. Troubling if the client comes in and they're struggling with out-of-control sexual behaviors around it. So if the client says, I don't want to do this, I don't like to do this, it doesn't seem right for my religion, it doesn't seem right for my values, the therapist doesn't try to unpack all that. Mostly we're taught, then you go with that and you, and you slap them on with the sex addiction label and you put them into the groups and you help them stop that behavior. And that's not where I go anymore. Which in a sense is that sex negativity approach where we buy into this idea that there's one way to be healthy, there's one ideal way to be sexual, and if you don't fit that, then you're either expected to change or alter or be accountable for certain behaviors. Is that fair? Yes, it's left to the therapist's discretion. But then the other part to that, part two is, if the client's telling you they're struggling, then then they're struggling. And you are to go in the direction that they are telling you to go, which I agree with in one sense, but in another sense, it, it's our responsibility to say, wait a minute, this might be normative for you. There might be something in this that is something other than what we would call an, an addiction. Are you willing to look at that? And that's not something to differentiate the, the diagnosis. That's not something we were trained in. Yeah, and I agree with that because, you know, I don't think that in any other area of psychotherapy are we expected to just go where the client wants us to go. If somebody comes in and says, hey, I'm, I'm depressed and I want to stay depressed and I think this is a great way to be. I mean, we're, we're there to <laughs> challenge, right? I mean, we're there to listen and to validate and to join and obviously to not shame people for wherever they're at. And I think that's how I define meeting somebody where they're at. But at the same time, it is our role. I think we're being paid and, you know, people are spending their energy and monies with us to be able to have a different perspective as well. And so that's always a tricky balance, I think, for therapists, because we do want to respect people's values. We do want to respect their uh, religious upbringings if they're coming with that an entity that's, that's important to them. And at the same time, we want to give good psychoeducation, good sexual education, and also make it possible for people to have different experiences than they're currently having. Totally. Uh, so, you know, we would say to people that come in, we're trained to say, yeah, you know, why would you get into this? What does this mean about you? And we, there's a term in the uh, sex addiction field called arousal template, which I don't think is a bad term, but it's become something negative because usually you're telling somebody your arousal template is pathologized, meaning your fantasies, your sexual interests, your sexual behaviors is embedded in your arousal template. And we have to stop that behavior and stop you even thinking this way. So in, in essence, you're giving somebody an erotic activity, right? You're saying, hey, you're coming in, you're out of control with this behavior. So we need to stop this behavior and, and you may never be able to go back. And what I ended up saying at the, toward the end of my connection with sex addiction people is, well, wait a minute. What if you're dealing with a heterosexual guy who's having out of control sexual experiences with PIV and heterosexual intercourse and can't stop and is getting sore and is doing it six times a day with a partner? Would you then say, well, we're so sorry, your arousal template is corrupt and you'll never be able to have PIV, sexual intercourse, heterosexual intercourse with a woman again. You're going to have to find a different way to be sexual. And people looked at me like I had three heads. Like, why would you even ask that? And to me, it reinforced the heteronormativity. You have prejudged anything other than that as pathology. So now you're going to use that for the model of sex addiction. It reminds me of being gay in the 60s and 70s. 
it had already been determined by therapy that homosexuality was wrong. And so there was a pathology and you were looking at the reasons that caused somebody's homosexuality because the end result was negative rather than saying, maybe there's nothing wrong with you. Maybe what's wrong is you have a lot of shame. It goes against values you've learned. It goes against teachings you learned that you just need to reteach yourself. There could be so many positive ways to look at this. And that's not what we were taught. Yeah, so that gets us to the definitions of sexual positivity, which is more of an acceptance of a lot of things, of like you're saying, your orientation, of arousal templates, of different interests and tastes and partnerships and creativity and a lot of different things without allowing the therapist's experience to get in the way of that. And this term that you keep using, pathologizing, meaning that, yeah, a lot of times we in other words, make something a disease that isn't necessarily deemed a disease. And that's an interesting point, too, because sex addiction is not currently a diagnosis. So do you want to talk a little bit about how in your training as a CSAT, if that was ever addressed or how that was addressed, how do you come up with criteria and, in essence, telling people you have a certain problem when it's not an official diagnosis? I will tell you that in my training and experience, it was mostly act-centered. So you were taught, and there is still teaching in this way. I've taken some webinars from sexual addiction therapists to see how they're still teaching it, where they create a list. I have a PowerPoint frame you know, that I should screenshot. It's basically saying, are you buying porn? Are you paying prostitutes? Are you having sex outside of your relationship? As if those behaviors are going to be able to tell you whether somebody has a sex addiction or not. That's ridiculous. That doesn't tell you anything. It tells you that the person had sex with prostitutes, watched pornography, and that may be an interest to kind of understand their arousal template, to try to understand what they're looking for in their behaviors. But the behaviors themselves, uh, to pathologize them is to miss the point. The point should be, what is the relationship you have to this sexual behavior? Why are you drawn to this kind of sexual behavior? What's in it for you? And that comes from a more positive, it could be something negative. It doesn't start out with a pathological reason. It starts out with a wondering of, okay, where does this come from? Because for most of us, most of our sexual interests and fantasies come from childhood and from our, how we're socialized and from religion. And then it gets all embedded in our erotic life. And that's normal. It's what we do with that and how we handle that that ends up being problematic. And you talked about, obviously, therapists having our own personal experience and how that gets in the way sometimes. So do you want to talk a little bit about the theoretical model of CSATs? Because I do know that trauma is definitely a big piece of that, as far as there's a kind of assumption yes. that people have been traumatized in their youth, and that's why there's, quote-unquote, sexually acting out in their adulthood. So do you want to talk a little bit about that piece? As a sex addiction therapist and CSAT, I became really good at trauma therapy, and I'm very happy about that. I got really good training. They were really good at that and really good at addictionology and understanding addictionology. The problem is there was no sex education training at all. And so to a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So to a man trained as trauma therapist, everything looks like trauma. Even when it is trauma, there was no understanding that trauma reenactment can turn into trauma play, because now we're talking about sexual pleasure. I guess that's the difference. Sex addiction is all about sexual dysfunction and disgust and negativity, where sexual health is about sexual pleasure, sexual values, and your relationship with your sexual behavior. So embedded in the training, it just didn't have anything other than how to help somebody recognize that this is most likely a trauma response. 97% of the patients he saw in the inpatient setting were sexually abused. And I remember thinking as a sex addiction therapist, well, maybe that's all that was. When you've been sexually abused, especially you're a male, you become hypersexual. And that hypersexuality is a response to early trauma. Once you deal with the sexual abuse, the hypersexuality goes away. That's not sex addiction. That's sexual abuse recovery. So to me, the, the sex addiction diagnosis, so to speak, which isn't even real, gets slapped on too many people with too many different things. There's no differential diagnosis. Can you tell me a little bit about what it took to become a CSAT? So just kind of walk us through the process of getting that certification, what was entailed, 
Can you talk a little bit about how all of that is organized? You know, it was a while back now. It's like the early 2000s. There were four modules that you were to go through, and you learned different things. I don't remember which module had what. I can just tell you for sure that none of them had anything about sexual health or sex therapy or sex education. It was pretty much about addictionology, about trauma therapy, courtship disorders like intimacy and attachment disorders. The learning, I can't say is bad. It's really, really good learning. It's the lack of sex. Here are all these therapists dealing with sexual disorders and know nothing about sexual disorders. And can you talk a little bit about how you define addictionology? Because that's probably a term people are maybe not as familiar with or, or could come with a lot of assumptions. Okay, that's good too. So addiction, it's an understanding that, you know, someone has failed attempts to stop. It's interfering with your life and you continue to use. It has a progression, meaning that over time you're going to want to do more. So here's the thing. You might have failed attempts to stop, but maybe it's because you don't want to stop. Maybe you're being labeled a sex addict because you've been a serial cheater in your relationships, but the truth might be you're just not monogamous. And no one's ever given you permission nor yourself to understand that, you know, I know I keep picking partners who want monogamy, but I don't because we're a monogonormative culture. Everything should be about monogamy. So instead of looking at that, it would be, well, you're going against what you said you were going to do, so this indicates a problem. Yes, but it doesn't indicate a sex addiction. It indicates a problem with your values, progression. If you have a fetish or a kink, there is an absolute progression and an increase in desire for that kink, for that fetish. It's normative. Once I learned that as a sex therapist, I was like, oh, this isn't like progression like a disease. This is progression. Instead of progression, I call it evolution. Your sexuality, in fact, all of us have an evolution in how we operate with our sexuality and have our relationship with our sexuality. But that's not how it's looked at in the addiction treatment. It's looked at as, oh, no, you're doing more. You want more. Something's wrong. Like an alcoholic. Now you're drinking three drinks. Now you went to five drinks. Now your tolerance is really high. It's a bad parallel. I usually relate this to cooking classes or my knitting (laughs) that I started with uh, very basic patterns, but then I got really excited about it and got harder and harder patterns to work on. (laughs) Took more time to do it. (laughs) But that's really true of any interest, right? I mean, anything that interests (laughs) us, we're going to be stimulated by. And so we're going to want more and more information or more and more activity with it. And so that's, to your point, a normal part of human development. Okay, so these four modules, can you tell me a little bit about what that was like? Was that over the internet? Did you go somewhere to have these trainings? Were they a week long, a year long? What time commitment and what types of interactions were you having as far as with supervisors, etc., to get this certification? You know, I had no negative issues around any of that. Again, these are a long time ago, so I don't know what they're like now, but they were like week long. So you go for a full week. Now I was grandfathered in. I didn't go through all four of them because they had felt that I had been such a long time sex addiction therapist. And I had been that I didn't need all four modules. So after two full weeks of training different times, they grandfathered me in as a sex addiction therapist. So I didn't have any problem with anyone. It wasn't really for me, it wasn't until I entered ASEC, American Association of Sex Educators, Counselors, and Therapists, and started to become a member of that community of certified sex therapists and realized the missing link that was glaringly missing in all of my teachings. You know, and I was sitting with people that would say, well, it must be, why would a man want to dress as a woman and cross-dress? I remember hearing this in my classes and from supervisors who would say, why would he want to humiliate himself like that? Why would somebody engage in spanking behavior in pain when sex is supposed to be about love and tenderness and furthest from pain? And then I started to learn in sex therapy that some people have eroticized pain Some people have eroticized humiliation, and some people don't feel humiliated in wearing women's clothing. They have other feelings going on. So I would start in that organization saying, hey, this is what I've learned. And then people would say, well, that doesn't make any sense, and I don't agree with that. And then people would say, we had like a whole conversation about homosexuality and that, and I have this. There are people that to live a life as a gay person would be to lead a life of depression. So they come to therapy and they say, help me not necessarily not be gay, but not live this way. 
on the sex addiction listserv, what a con- and I saved all my emails. I mean, I because I, I thought I was crazy after a while because people told me this wasn't true, but it did happen. Where therapists were saying that they saw homosexuality through a moral lens, and through that moral lens, they were going to provide sex addiction treatment to someone who didn't want to be gay. Well, to me, first of all, we're not a religious organization. We're a psychological organization. And so moral lens needs to be, it's completely unethical. And I would said that. And secondly, that sounds like reparative therapy disguised as sexual addiction therapy. It was at that, that point that I was censored and pretty much told that I was provocative, that therapists should have the right to say whatever they want on this listserv. And I said, I don't agree with that. And they said, you don't have to agree with that. This is our organization. This is how we're going to roll. That's when I started realizing that some of the... Oh, and then another therapist said, I never have met a client or anyone else who made an identity around what they like to do sexually. I don't understand. So I said, okay, let me help you understand. And they said, no, thank you. (laughs) So what I started realizing and was so sad, actually, is there was no room for dialogue. There was only room for one way of thinking, and that's when I started to move away from them. In comparison, how would you describe the CST training? In the sex addiction community, I was the go-to gay therapist, you know? And I have to say, 10 years ago, when anybody would say something that would seem homophobic or misinformed, I was the guy to say, whoa, guys, that's kind of homophobic, and I would explain why. And the organizations would say, oh, wow, we never thought about it. Actually, one woman got on the list. We don't know how she got on there on sex addiction. And she was really homophobic. I think she was a reparative therapist. And I kept very nicely and gently saying, this is not okay. This isn't true in the gay world. And eventually, they realized this woman should have not even been on the listserv. And they removed her and thanked me. So this is like maybe 12 years ago. But then five years ago, when I started talking like this again, because it was starting to happen again, I was not met with any interest or positivity. I was instead seen as somebody that was provocative and causing problems. When I became a certified sex therapist, I wasn't the only gay person. So there was no, I was no gay expert. Everybody had expertise. It was sort of like everybody had a nuanced understandings of all the different ways that sexuality can express itself. But I will say that the biggest problem I noticed as a certified sex therapist is that at least for the last few years, in the beginning of it, nobody had an understanding of working with out of control sexual behaviors. And that was disappointing to me, which is why I kept my CSAT and my CST, because I felt like I still needed to work with people who are sexually struggling. That's not fair. You can't just have your clients come in and go, oh, well, that's no big deal. You know, just kind of get used to it. That's not necessarily what CS certified sex therapists were saying, but they weren't offering any other way to help these people. And it wasn't until Doug Braun Harvey and some other people, Eli Coleman had always been in the background trying to teach us other ways, became bigger voices to say, we do have our own models. They're just different. And then I started to get involved with those. And what was the certification process like, if you want to talk a little bit about what it took to get your CST? Well, I was really upset because I thought I'd be grandfathered in. Here I was. See, even though I was a sex addiction therapist, I was sex negative, but I was also sex positive, and I don't know why, but I've always kept a positive ear and eye on what people were doing, and I really wasn't pathologizing people's sexual expressions 100%. I really understood, I think just because I was gay and I think because I'm a man, I I think my own intersectional identities of being gay and being a male sort of helped me understand there are some things that are normal that most culture doesn't understand. I felt that when I applied for my CST that I'd be grandfathered in. And they said, nope, way too much sexual addiction. You don't know enough around sexual disorders. And as angry as I was at the time, they were right. I really didn't. And so I had to get the full 50 hours, all the supervision, everything anyone had to do. And I'm so glad because I learned that so much of what I had thought or even been taught as a sex addiction therapist was wrong. That there can be healthy ways and healthy expressions of not being monogamous, of, you know, not having intercourse. Fetishes are not sex addiction. So somebody would come in and have a fetish and a sex addiction therapist would label them as a sex addict. Instead of understanding that orthodox fetishes look like sex addiction, the person has to have it. It's interfering with their life. 
it does progress over time, but it really, it evolves over time. And if you know how to do correct therapy with them, correct sex therapy, you can help them manage their fetish. You're not going to eradicate it. You're not going to eliminate it, but you can include other ways of being sexual because when they come into your office, usually it's the only way they know how to be sexual. And as a sex therapist, I learned, no, this is okay. We're not going to take this away from you. We're going to add to your sex life. Sex addiction therapy didn't have an appreciation for that. Yeah, where if I heard you before earlier, the sex addiction approach was more about stopping certain behaviors and never returning to them. Was there something that you said about that? Yeah, like why would you want to have a, a sexual relationship with a shoe? Wouldn't you want it to be with a person? Well, yes, but can it be both? Can I like shoe? Can I have a shoe fetish? And can I like a person? Can we add to it rather than take away from it? That's the misunderstanding in that community. Right. Well, and, and I think the statistics showing also that even when people try very hard to stop a certain sexual, I guess, arousal fetish or some other type of thing, it's just, it's just not really something that most people are successful at. We don't, like right. you're saying, we can add to and we can expand, but as far as taking something that turns you on and figuring out how to not have it turn you on anymore... My understanding is that in the literature is that that's not really something that happens. No, right. And they, they didn't have that research there. And really, I had hoped that I could be one of the educators there to help them. And then really, this is kind of what cemented my decision to completely leave. You know, there's all kinds of 12-step groups. There's Sex Addicts Anonymous, where you make your own boundaries and recovery. There's Sex and Love Ad Addicts Anonymous, where you make your own boundaries around sex, but also around love addiction. They, the whole thing about romance addiction and, you know, which I don't believe in. I just think it's, there are people that have poor impulse control around their romantic feelings. And, and there's all kinds of psychological reasons. You don't get addicted to the dopamine and to amphetamine that, you know, and phenylethylamine that, that get released. We know so much more now these days. And then there's compulsive sex anonymous, which is for gay men. And then there's sexaholics anonymous, you should know that on the sex addiction listservs and their websites, both of them, they had Sexaholics Anonymous as a referral source, as a resource. So a straight therapist came out and said, we need to rethink this. We're in 2015 or 12 or whatever it was. This doesn't seem right anymore. And the organization said, oh, no, we think it's right because there are people for whom Sexaholics Anonymous would work. Sexaholics Anonymous says only sex within a marriage between a man and a woman. Anything else is acting out. So gay men were going to these meetings, and these would be men I would consider that had high levels of internalized homophobia to be willing and able to sit into a meeting and have people tell them, because you're not heterosexually legally married, you are acting out and you're off the grid of health. And I became more vocal about this should be something that if somebody wants to find, why do we need to have that in the organization? We're endorsing it, in other words. And they didn't agree, and I didn't agree, and I left as a result of that. And I think it's terrible. Yeah. Okay. So ASEC came out with a position statement against the use of the pathologizing of sex addiction just last year or this year. I'm forgetting which year, but just recently. Do you want to share some of your thoughts about that? Because it is an interesting dilemma that we're currently having in our own organization of ASECT, where obviously somebody with a CSAT certification can be getting their CST. So there's still a lot of interweaving, right, of these two professions. And, and in some ways that's good because there's a lot of discussion and there's a lot of people maybe like in your position that over time shift their views more into a sex positive perspective. I remember myself being very much in that position. I mean, when I first started and was hearing some of the sex addiction rhetoric, I, I felt very comfortable with it at that time, you know, 20 years ago, mm -hmm. I could see myself moving in that direction. I remember attending a workshop. The only thing that was a red flag for me at the time, you know, homework assignment, go read some scriptures, go have a date with your wife, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And somehow this is going to stop this behavior. And what I was seeing in my practice is that that would just really move that person towards ongoing secrecy and lying and shame because when the behavior didn't stop the way everybody had expected, then it was too difficult to 
own up to it again or confess about it again. And so I was seeing a lot of the therapists around me were raising their hands and talking about how their treatment centers were dealing with some of these issues. I was just like, oh my gosh, this sounds a lot like a bishop's office. (laughs) And how, how are they going to really account for the idea that, you know, people are not going to be truthful with us if we just become another accountability kind of policing process. So I don't know, I, maybe I lost my question in all of that, but speak to, to maybe that idea of the position of ASECT and some of the issues that we have now with both these types of professionals trying to, I guess, li- live I, together. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I, I, I support the position of ASEC because I mean, while I understand and I know many CSATs that are also CSTs, you know, they get it and they're able to understand the nuances of sex and they're using some of the model from CSAT. They're not the bigger voices that are out there. The bigger voices are those sex addiction therapists who are moral, who are religious. They have moral beliefs. They're out there saying that porn is bad. This whole thing about porn is a health crisis. I keep saying to people, well, how come it's not a health crisis amongst gays and lesbians? If we're having a health crisis, it should be for all people. And it's not. And so there's, again, no new, the the major organizations and still referring to Sexaholics Anonymous to me says we need to distance from these organizations. These individual therapists need to make their own voices. But the organization is looking more and more like a reparative therapy for sex, just like reparative therapy for gay is pray the gay away. There's nothing gay about being homosexual. It's very parallel to there's nothing pleasurable around certain sexual behaviors to whom the question is to whom and the organization is very vocal about this so to me any way that an organization can distance from another organization that again for me is the biggest issue is lacks sexual health i just learned that a lot of therapists think that sex addiction therapists are sex therapists that is so frightening to me you have no idea the furthest people from being a sex therapist, unless they've had additional training. So to me, distancing from the organization seems appropriate until they get into 2017. Two thoughts I have when you said, ther- you know, therapists think that. I think, well, the public thinks that, which is even scarier yes. to me, right? Because how's the public supposed to know all of these things? Which is why I'm mm-hmm. trying to have these types of discussions in podcast form. So is to help the public understand the differences and the people that they're seeking out for help. And then the second point that I was going to make is I think language matters. So even amongst like colleagues that I feel are very sex positive and are sex therapists and do great work, I still see a propensity, and maybe this is me being too picky, so feel free to jump on me about this, but um, that we use the terms sex addiction. I see it on people's websites And so I understand that on the one hand, you know, that's a term that people are using in the media and in the public sphere. People are comfortable with that term. And so when we are trying to bring clients through our doors, we're saying, well, if you think you have a problem with this or you think that this is a problem, then I'm willing to help you with this problem. At the same time, I find somewhat of a professional duty to not use language that's inappropriate. So if I'm a cancer provider... I'm not going to use language that would be medically incorrect just because I'm trying to get people through my door. So I, I have a little bit of an issue of using the term addiction for sexuality in general. So feel free to, to roast me, though, because I know that I get super picky about these kinds of things. Well, here's what I've been taught, and I, I do this now. I put sex addiction in quotes. So it's understood that while I will use the word you use, I and so because I want people to come in and get the help they need. I heard Doug Brown Harvey say it, and I love it. So I say it now. If you went into the doctor and said, I have cancer, the doctor wouldn't say, well, thank God I don't have to do all those tests. We're going to get you chemotherapy. We're going to get you on radiation, and let's just get you in a support group for people who have cancer. No. Responsibly, he would say, Okay, that's great that you've done some self-diagnosis. Let's slow this down. Let's unpack this. Let's do some tests. Let's get some things done. And then together we'll see what the test results say after we've had lots of discussion around this. I feel the same thing has to happen when someone comes in and self-diagnosis. I'm a sex addict. Okay, well, I'm not going to rush in like I used to do and bring in all my sex addiction treatment and 12 steps. And I'm going to say, well, let's talk about why you think that and what does this mean? And 
mean, really, I've had women in my office say to their husbands, look, I'd rather you be a sex addict than be a pervert, because if this is really what you get into, my disgust response will not allow me to stay married to you. So you're going to have to be a sex addict. And so then the therapist, again, would help him be a sex addict because they want to save the marriage. That's easy therapy, but it's not correct therapy. The correct therapy is let's slow this down. Let's talk about what this is all bringing up for you, and let's see what's really going on for him. So that's what I do. Sex addiction brings them in the door, but that's not where I start. Right. So, yeah, so I agree with that. I I like Doug's approach on that as well. I guess my only concern is that if somebody comes in and says cancer, we know that cancer is an actual diagnosis that we can go through criteria and see if you have it or not. If somebody comes in and says, well, I've got googly gop, I'd be like, well, what's googly gop? You know, I don't even know that that's (laughs) something that I know how to assess for. Right. And so that's, I think, one of the issues that we have still going on a lot in our profession is understanding the differentiation of that. And also this issue that we have with hypersexuality, which is probably a diagnosis that's going to be coming down, you know, I think in the ICD-11 or, and there's a lot of research showing that people can have higher libidos and others, et cetera. But again, making sure that that's not pathologized, that just because we know certain bodies do certain different things, that that's not necessarily meaning it's a disease. So those are just interesting dilemmas, I think, about this whole subject. Two things I wanted to touch base on before we totally end. You had mentioned at the very beginning that you wanted to talk, and you have a little bit here and there talked about how both males and especially gay and bisexual men are more directly affected by these types of diagnoses than other parts of our population. Do you want to expound on that? Yeah. So there's a cultural competency that's missing in sex addiction treatment, which is gay men do have more multiple partners. Because we can, you know, when you take women out of the equation, and I'm making sweeping generalizations, but in general, women want to slow down. Women want to know each other. Billy Crystal has this joke, women need a reason to have sex. Men just need a place. And so if you take women out of the equation, you're going to get men who are having higher numbers and higher frequencies of partners. And in the sex addiction community, that's pathologized. Rather than in the sex therapy community, it's sort of understood, okay, this is a cultural Thing that happens in that community, how do you, my client, interact with that cultural competency? What does that mean to you? And then the ways in which gay men and bisexual men and men in general are more open about their kinks, their fetishes, they're more interested in, in maybe less relational sex, or in addition to relational sex, they're having objectified sex with each other, with their partners, with their women. And so this is not okay in the sex addiction community. What do you mean you're not having relational sex? You know, it's one thing to have a quickie with your partner, but now you want to, you know, bring in kinks, things like maybe be more aggressive, verbal abuse, choking, bidding, things that people might enjoy together without sexual education to understand why people get off on that and get into that. It would be pathologized. And not that women don't get into that. They're starting to show research that more and more women are enjoying and allowing themselves to enjoy more kinky sex, non-vanilla kinds of sex. But men in general have more interest in that and more permission within themselves, especially gay and bi men. And I just found the sex addiction community to be pathologizing of all of that. Yeah, so you're more likely to have a sex addiction, quote unquote, diagnosis if you're a male, if you're gay or bisexual, and also I believe socioeconomics also has something to do with this as well as race, if my understanding is correct. In other words, white men and higher socioeconomic status, it seems like. And high morality, high religion. You know, it's funny because David Lay, I learned that from David Lay about what you just said. And I remember learning as a CSAT that most of the treatment centers were filled with men who were highly successful and had a lot of money and had a lot of productivity and CEOs. And now I understand they have more at risk, you know, to engage in sexual behaviors that don't meet our cultural norms. So it's not that 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 population's more at risk, in terms of of having these behaviors, they're more at risk of being judged and judging themselves for having these behaviors. That's the issue. And they have more resources, quite frankly, to even be in these treatment centers to begin with, probably. So absolutely, absolutely not usually covered. Well, some are covered by insurance, but not all. And these can be thousands and thousands of dollars of treatments. One thing I just wanted to say too about your comment about women, just so that the public doesn't misunderstand. I mean, 
there's not as many differences, I think, between men and women anatomically or biologically as we might think. I mean, there are a few. I mean, obviously, there's different hormones happening for women and men. At the same time, it's the huge cultural overlays that we're still recovering from. And women have very much been given the script of monogamy, of relational aspects of their sexuality, yep. and definitely repressing messages about their own sexual tastes and erotica. It's very male-centric. Sexuality has always been very male-centric. And so please don't take those comments from Dr. Court to mean that, that these are actual fixed differences between men and women. And like you mentioned, there's, there, we're seeing some of those things shift as women become more empowered in their sexuality and have more freedoms to claim their own sexual interests. Well, and here's what's interesting. I'm glad you said that because sex addiction treatment recently came out in the last few years and said they're seeing a rise of sex addiction of 40% in women. And I think what they're seeing is what you just said is women giving themselves permission to explore and be able to have the sexuality that they've had to suppress for their whole lives. Right. Yeah, especially coming from Christian country, religious backgrounds, all of that. There's just many, many messages about women's sexuality really not being their own. Okay, so yeah. um, the moral part is something I just want to talk about just a little bit more. In every ethical agreement that we as therapists basically agree to have in our in our line of work is something along the lines of watching our own biases and not allowing our own morality or our own religious beliefs or our own non-religious beliefs whatever those things are to in essence get in the way of our work with clients now we all know that at some level this is impossible because it's impossible to know all over your own biases but it's something that's taken very seriously in the mental health professional world, and it's part of our agreement. And so it's been interesting, especially with all the current talk of religious freedoms in our country and laws that are being passed to protect people in regards of having, in essence, in my opinion, religious freedoms to discriminate against others, <laughs> that really this is a dilemma, a moral dilemma, I think, for the mental health professionals themselves. And and I see this as a huge part of this discussion is our own, and you've been talking about it all along, you know, allowing for our own morality, our own religious values, our own ideas of what relational systems should look like that get in the way of good sexual health treatment. And I just want to point that out because I do want to make sure that people understand that this is unethical. And I think I've been called out oftentimes by calling other colleagues unethical, that that's maybe rude of me or dramatic of me or, and I'm not trying to be dramatic. I'm sure I've done things that are unethical. I think we all have, and that's part of growing and developing as a mental health professional. But this is unethical behavior to allow your own religious norms and values to get in the way of other people's sexual health treatment. So any further thoughts you want to talk about that particular point, Joe? No, I would agree with you. And I would say that when I do my trainings all across the country, I always ask in the very beginning, I do LGBT trainings, and I say, how many therapists in here have had any form of sex education or sex therapy training beyond their master's? And three people out of 50 to 70 therapists raise their hand. And I in no way mean to shame them, but I do mean to say and you're working with couples, and you're working with people that are coming with sexual disorders, and I was one of you, I was remiss, and I would say that so are you. You need to have some additional training. You don't have to become a total sex therapist expert, but you need to have more training than, than nothing. Yes, I agree. And this is even the case with very prominent people that I have a lot of respect for, like the Gottmans or Sue Johnson, or people that I use their work all the time and have a lot of respect for and do really great relational work. But good relational work does not always mean good sexual work in the sense no. of how we think about those terms, right? In other words, good relationships don't always have good sex and bad relationships can have great sex and there's a lot of stuff in between. So I think that it's really important to understand the difference between those two. And this idea, too, that if your religious values, you're not able to put those aside, then maybe this isn't the profession for you, which is okay, too. It's okay. But the profession itself does not need to make room for religious discrimination. No, that's not our job. That may be the job of religious counselors out there. I don't know, but not for professional psychological and psychotherapeutic counselors therapists. Correct. All right. So I'd just like to give you your last hurrah moment to share with us just your last paragraph of thoughts of, I went from a CSAT to a CST. 
what was that about for you and what thoughts do you want to leave us with? You know, so for me, it was professional and it was personal. I relaxed how I saw myself and really recognized and understood the nuances that existed within me. And they were much more complicated and much more difficult than to just be a clean, I'm a sex addict and here's what I do. And sex is not clean. It's dirty. It's messy. It's smelly. So is it in the therapy room. It's dirty. It's messy. It's smelly. It's joyous. It's beautiful. It's gross. It's all of those things. And we need to make room for that in the therapy room and in our own personal lives. I love that. I always say sex is smelly and dirty and fun and all that. But now I'm going to start saying that that <laughs> happens in the therapy room, too. Not literally. But <laughs> <laughs> right. Not literally. That's right. <laughs> That's a different type of work. <laughs> but anyway, well, I want to thank you so much for your time, Dr. Court. I really appreciate it. I think this is such an important discussion to keep on having and hopefully in ways that we can respect everybody's professional journey. I know that, like I say, it's not like I came to these positions overnight. It was many years as it was for you as well. And I totally have empathy for those who have spent a lot of their own money and energies and are committed to a certain type of way of thinking. And it's always hard to change. I, I know that I've had to change some of my thinking and that has not been an easy process for me. So I hopefully want to have these discussions in ways that can honor people's experiences and their thoughts about this, even though we may disagree vehemently about some things. So thank you for your time. Yep. Yeah. Thank you for having me. minutes into miles And as the evening traveled on The sunset bathed your smile We stopped beneath the desert stars Wrapped in each other's arms Was as simple as I love you An ordinary, extraordinary truth It's been a long road here A trail If sometimes we fell apart, we always came back home. Was as simple as I love you, an ordinary, extraordinary. It 
It's as simple as our love is. That's how I wanna go. All wrapped up in the arms of our extraordinary. It's nothing hard to marry love. Ordinary, no, it's extraordinary.